kind of see how this is doing. Going really, really live in like two minutes. Let me check the camera. All right, a little bit more. Cat, you're in the way. That should do it. Okie dokie. We got it. So, here we go in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome everybody, this is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Live, coming to you the first Tuesday every month where you get the opportunity to interact with me, Jeremy, host of the show, Whistlekick Dude, hashtag, hashtag? Hashtag whistle prez. Uh, so thanks for coming by. If you're watching this, you probably also see the chat. Please ask questions, contribute. The reason we do this show is so that I can interact with you. And it's the one time a month that we do that. All the other episodes are pre-recorded. And as great as that is, there's something fun about doing stuff live. Got a lot of material to go through here. With you, lots of great stuff. As always, shout out to Gabe for putting this together, for helping with so much on the back end. He's great, and I appreciate him tremendously. First thing we got to do, um, because this just popped up for me in like a month, uh, like an hour ago, and I, I can't exactly ignore it. Some stuff going down right now. Um, stuff with Iran, and I just want to. Send my prayers out to all the people involved. It's, it, I, I believe strongly in not involving politics in business, so I will not be talking about it any more than that, but did want to acknowledge it. So, all right. We got some people in the chat. We got it, we got it going on. So, let's start in on this. Let's get into a recap of live episode three, which was from, what was that, December or something? I don't remember. Doesn't really matter. A couple things, if you missed it. So this is the second episode from this set, from in front of the wood stove, which is not on today because it's not nearly as cold as it was. And, you know, did, did people care that we were here? Uh, generally speaking, it was well received, but I didn't get the impression from the votes that it was uh, it was a big deal. All right. Stacy even said, I'd watch wherever it is, but that said, it was nicer. Other notable things from episode three. Martial arts is not about quantity, it's about quality. Absolutely. I probably said all of these things. A diverse martial artist is a better martial artist, not just in what you know, but what you do. I definitely said that. I'm not the right person to teach you how to win a fight. I'm the person to teach you how to not get in a fight. And it's funny, I've actually got an idea for a book based entirely on that. And if you don't know, oh, I don't have one handy. Uh, 
um, Martial Artist Handbook. It is starting to ramp up. We're starting to get some momentum behind it, so I'm really excited about that. Shout out to the people who have started leaving reviews. Uh, I just put a pile of autograph books in the mail today. If you want to order one, whistlekick.com. Uh, what is it, 20, $22.99, something like that. It covers all the shipping, so i got to ship it here, i got to ship it to you. Um, got to pay for the book. And I'm finding I'm enjoying this whole book thing. It's kind of fun. Last I looked, there were a couple... Uh, there were a couple more sales today. I don't know. I've never really sold... Um, really, I've never sold a book before. I don't know how this works. On the topic of leadership in martial arts schools, Craig... In our dojo, students need to learn how to instruct and inspire in order to lead classes. Stacy, learning how to teach and inspire were core to my success as a Zumba chair fitness instructor. I don't, I don't think there's any more important role for a leader than to inspire. You can be skilled, you can be competent, you can be articulate, you can be organized. You can be methodical, but if you don't inspire others, all of that is irrelevant. Now, of course, inspiring people without those other skills can lead to problems, but if you don't have some level of inspiration, if people aren't willing to trust you with their time, in the case of martial arts, with their body, you really can't help them. If the martial arts were developed today, what would the weapons look like? We had... Uh, a single real response there. Laura said, selfie sticks. I don't see anybody with selfie sticks anymore. And I'm probably good with that. And there are a lot of people really stretching their arms, trying to take pictures. I clearly don't have long arms, so I'm not doing any kind of massive group shots. But, you know, hey, if you want to use a selfie stick, do it. If somebody's trying to mug you and you have a selfie stick, break it over their head. Material coming out of Facebook. What is your most memorable testing experience? Mindy, I have more than one. Two are the anticipation of... Is it worded funny? I have more than one. Two are the anticipation of waiting for my black belt sons, and the other is the feeling when I got my brown belt recently. Oh, okay. I, I know Mindy. She has two children. Two of them, two separate ones. The anticipation of waiting for her black belt sons, and the other is the feeling when she received her brown belt recently. She is not yet a black belt... She'll get there soon. Shout out to the entire family. Uh, Padme. Wasn't mine, but my husband's. I'm the sensei owner. My husband decided upon himself that his test for yellow belt needed to be epic. There's a little bit of foreshadowing there. He took off on a nearly 20 mile bike ride before his test, carrying boards to break. So at the end of his black belt test, years later, which included the same bike ride, plus a Zumba class, and then his testing. I gave him two Rubik's Cubes to complete. One was the basic regular colors, but the other one was shades of gray and black. He was so wiped out that he could not separate what colors were which. <laughs> That's horrible, the idea of a Rubik's Cube at the end of a test. Now, I can appreciate the idea of having to think in the midst of physical pain, discomfort, stress. Uh, in fact, there, there's someone, shout out to the sky, that I used to train with, not martial arts, but uh, generalized fitness things, who loved making us think in the middle of workouts. And you want to talk about adding in drills that encourage students to think logically and intelligently and calm Quiz them. Quiz them on factual things. Stacy's giving a shout out to Master Grogan and his selfie stick. He does. If you attend any of the 518 events in the capital area of New York, you've likely seen Master Grogan. He is the one running around with a selfie stick getting shots with everybody. He's a great guy. Shout out to him and, and his whole team there. Gabe says, I'd never pass a test if I had to solve a Rubik's Cube. Me either. I've never completed one. Uh, I had a friend that I watched pull the stickers off and put them back on in the right spots once, but that was it. That was as close as I got. Excuse me. To it. 
to a completed Rubik's Cube. Here's a poll. Three old and equally wise masters live at the top of a mountain and will offer advice to anyone who makes the climb, but you can only talk to one. Who do you choose? The one who started with nothing? The one who never had any students? The one who was naturally gifted? The overwhelming answer was the one who started with nothing. And we had a, a notable comment by Halford Jones. There is no need to choose any of them or to seek advice if you know how to sense, observe, say nothing, ask nothing, just be present. And I think I know where he's going with that. I Prior to martial arts radio, I was quite fond of just observing and listening and sometimes asking questions. In fact, the very interview style that I bring to the show is not that foreign for me. And I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot of wonderful information just by listening. Let people talk. When people talk, you learn. Hello, Eric. Any favorite martial arts or martial arts school related holiday traditions? Matt says, I've made goofy holiday drills more for the kids, doing kicks with a Santa hat on or doing kicks with a Santa hat on, trying to not to knock it off, or doing a spin kick trying to get it to spin off. I'd draw Santa with a bag on the mirror and give students stars. Do drills, then try and throw stars in the bag for all the good little ninjas. I like that. <laughs> Chris says, Taikyoko Sho Poho Don. Uh, Taikyoko Shodan is a... Um, in, in some schools that I participated in, preceded uh, Pinyon or Heian Shodan, for those of you who may not train in that. It's a, it's a very fundamental form, kata. Uh, so when you when you ki-ai, he's saying you shout ho, ho, ho. So punch, punch, ho, ho, ho. I like that. That's fun. Good times. Uh, Eric's saying, go Vikings! Spent my morning working on all the color belt forms before work, and my hamstrings hate me. Well, good job working on that stuff. We got a bunch of people in the chat. Yeah. Glad to see some of you here. I really enjoy doing this show. It forces me to do things differently, because I need to get better doing video. And yeah, I mean, we've got First Cup, and if you've never watched First Cup, 6.30 Eastern on YouTube. And forces me to make sure I'm talking constantly. Excuse me. It forces me to be present and to work the camera and to look at a certain space. And I'm not great at that. I've never been great at that, but I feel like I'm getting better. When we do the audio episodes, if you were to watch me record a standard episode of Martial Arts Radio with a guest, I'm stepping back from the microphone. I'm fidgeting. I have a hard time spending 60 to 90 minutes with someone and looking them in the eye and doing all of that. And if you watch me, you can see that that comes through. I'm not constantly staring at that camera right there. I'm looking around. I have a hard time doing that. Now, if you sat down with me, if you know me personally, you know I'm pretty good at making eye contact. I'm going to show you that I'm listening and, and I'm respecting the things that you're saying. But when you're not here to give me that feedback back, ooh, it's tough. It's really tough. So got a, a question here from John. How did the Sifu Nate interview go? Well, we don't typically talk about interviews uh, prior to being released, but Sifu Nate's episode went well. I recorded with him at 4 p.m. today, so just a few hours ago. Uh, John saying he's a hidden gem in Connecticut, trained with a lot of people, great guy. Doesn't talk about himself much, so it should be interesting. Well, I would like to say he did a wonderful job. He talked about himself, and he told some fantastic stories. And I was disappointed to learn that we have been in the same place at the same time and just didn't meet each other. So now that we've had this conversation, that's a goal that we establish that next time we're in the same place, which I've got an idea when that's happening, we'll connect and uh, maybe grab a selfie.
this is a great conversation topic, and I'm really glad Gabe put this in. So it was a poll, didn't get a lot of responses, but I'm going to rant a little bit on this one. You're out in public, and you hear or see a fight starting to break out. Do you get closer, try to break it up, or settle the dispute? Get out of the area as quickly as possible? Watch from a distance? Maybe call the police? Or do nothing? There were a few votes for get closer, try to break it up, or settle the dispute. There were no votes for anything else. All right. So there was an episode, and I don't remember the number. Somebody will probably drop it in the chat. Uh, we rebroadcast, re re-pushed an episode from Sensei Endo's Fight for a Happy Life, where he and his wife were restraining a thief, uh, someone in a parking garage. And Ando was kind enough to come on the show, record a little bit of commentary. We had a little bit of discussion about it. Because the piece that I thought was really important for everyone to realize was that there were quite a few people, if memory serves me, a dozen people watching from afar. No one did anything to help. Now, I would like to think that those of us who have been training for a while are more likely to help others. But I have watched plenty of martial artists who think they have skill fall apart in even mildly stressful situations. And why do I bring this up? The same reason that we pushed that episode from Ando out when we did. If you get into a situation and you think other people are going to come to your aid simply because it is clearly the right thing to do, you are sadly mistaken. If you are not willing to engage whatever the situation is on your own, you should not be engaging. Plain and simple. Uh, what episode was that? Somebody can drop that in for me. Uh, got a lot of love for Sensei Ando. He's been a really supportive person. He's got a phenomenal YouTube channel. If you aren't subscribed, you should check it out. He does some great videos. I'm trying to think if there's been a situation where I've been in something like this. And once I graduated high school, I don't think there's been anything. Uh, I am constantly on the watch. For situations that could go awry. Friends know unless you're willing to take responsibility for watching the door, you better give me the seat that watches the door at a restaurant. Uh, I am, excuse me, I am known to carry knives or pepper spray or various things depending on the circumstances, depending on where I'm going, depending on what the little radar in my head is telling me because I will always choose to be over-prepared versus under-prepared. There is no way to ever be perfectly prepared. And I am fully prepared that whatever circumstance I get into, I'm gonna be in it on my own. I am not going to jump into a fight expecting that, hey, I'm gonna lead the charge and others are going to help me. What was the first thing we started talking about? We talked about inspiring and inspiring others. If I don't have a relationship with other people, how am I going to inspire them to, to join me? Uh, pardon me as I do incredibly nerdy things. Hey Google, set the heat in the hallway. Not sure what happened with the live feed, but thank you for letting me know in the chat that it went off. I turned it back on. So hopefully we will be back momentarily. Let's see what's going on. Is it working? And we're back. Yay, technology. I can't see it. Maybe if I hit refresh. I don't actually need to see it. I got the chat. That's all I need. Just let me know if it goes down again. What do you want? This is low tech. It's a phone on a tripod. We could, we, I could turn the camera. We could all watch the traffic go by. That's how I judge the quality of the roads. How slow are people driving? Um, yeah. I get riled up about this stuff for a lot of reasons with a lot of people 
Different reasons, but different people. Most people live in fantasy worlds. You know, most people are not really willing to connect with reality on violence. And that's why I try to bring guests on who will talk about this stuff because I'm, I'm trying. I feel like we have two camps in the martial arts. We've got traditionalists who think they understand violence and self-defense. And then we have others who are so mad at the first group for not understanding it that they go over the top in shoving it in everyone's face to prove that they don't really understand it. And what happens when you shove something in someone's face? They cover up, they back up, right? They're not receiving that information. So I think that there's a middle ground in trying to express that and show people that, hey, yes, traditional martial arts and techniques can be applicable if you understand the psychology and you reframe training, et cetera, to present it appropriately to the right demographics, right circumstances. And uh, guess what? Yeah, there's another book I'm considering. Let's move on. As we head into new, the new year, what are some of your favorite memories from your time training in 2019? Andrew says, favorite training was Whistle Kicks Free Training Day. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Leslie says, getting my show done, training at the Kodakon, the judo school, in Tokyo, Whistle Kicks Free Training Day, which everyone really should come to next year. Uh, in fact, if you're not RSVP to the event, which has no date yet, so you can't be busy. There's a Facebook event, so search uh, 2020 Free Training Day, you'll find it. Sword XP with Adrian Paul, who was on the show, wonderful guest. Some great martial arts experiences this year. I would completely agree. And uh, both Lessie and Andrew were new additions to the team in 2019 and have been wonderful, wonderful assets in helping grow things, as well as Gabe. Yeah, we really added quite a few people. Um, Frank, Stacy, we've, we've got quite the awesome team. Uh, Eric is saying two minute martial arts has been great. Yeah, Justin, I forget about Justin because he's so self-sufficient. Justin and I are working on a kind of a continuation of two minute martial arts. Um, it's an at home strength training program for martial artists that requires zero equipment. And we've worked out the framework and should have a draft of that done by the end of the month. Stay tuned. Jenny says, earning my second don in Taekwondo and my two older sons and I all took home grand champion in our association's annual, annual, can't talk, our association's annual tournament this year. It's a lot of vowels. I apologize for all the yawning. I'm really not that tired. I'm just not used to talking this much this late in the day. I'll have to caffeine up or something next time. Oh, I don't think that would be a good idea. I don't think anyone wants to see me at 8.30 at night on a bunch of caffeine. Get weird. Could get really weird. One of Gabe's favorite memories from 2019 took place about a month before his showdown test. I broke my hand at a tournament during the last fight in my division, which I won. I was scheduled to fight for Grand Champion, but the other guy was also hurt, so we decided to bow out. But since it was just the two of us, and we were all good friends, the center judge wouldn't let us. He made us play rock, paper, scissors for it, and I won. After the tournament, I wore a brace on that hand, and when people would ask how I broke my hand, I would just say, I kicked someone in the head, which is true. And the looks I got were awesome. P.S. I passed my showdown test with a broken hand. Congratulations. Eric is suggesting caveman coffee to handle my, uh, my yawning. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think. Free training day was, was definitely um, top on my list. And that's because the event requires relatively little work on my part. I get to see all my friends in a room. Everybody trains. I do some training. You know, I, I'm... 
I'm running the event, so I, I'm, I'm not comfortable doing a lot of the training sessions because a, many of them, interestingly enough, end up as, end up partner based, which is great because people get to work with each other and, and make friends, and, and that's awesome. But it's kind of a jerk move of me to get into a group and partner up with someone and go, oh, hey, I gotta go, and, and do that. So it's only really the sessions where there aren't partners that I'll step into and I'll, I'll do a little bit with. And I love that event. It's great. Um, other memories, of course, traveling to Florida for, what, third year in a row to train uh, with Bill Wallace for the Superfoot crew. Uh, Terry Dow Symposium, which is in March. Always love that. Um, had a lot of fun last year in Atlantic City at Ellen Goldberg's event. And in large part because I got to hang out with my friend Paul. Paul Milholland, who's been on the show a number of times. Uh, we're not going this year. Um, we both have other things going on. But... Um, there, there are people... There are people I will miss seeing that I generally only see at that event, so that's a bummer, but can't do everything. One of the things that's been a lot of fun, but also very frustrating about Whistlekick is that I am pulled in so many directions. Everybody wants me to come hang out at their thing. And fortunately, I'm not doing a booth setup anymore because that was even worse. I mean, who was I talking to? I was talking to somebody today that uh, across 2016, 2017, I was at an event every other weekend. Some, some weekends, I was at multiple events, and it just became, it was too much. It was too much. It was not a profitable thing for Whistlekick. It was not good for my health or my social life, and it was fine temporarily. It did a lot of good spreading the word and, and sharing what we do, but it was time to move on to different things like this kind of a show. What else? What other highlights? You could drink something gross to keep you awake, like kombucha. I actually like kombucha. Um, and I don't know why you would want me to drink something gross. That's mean. What were some of the other highlights? Just training. Got a lot of memories of training, going to Maine for training. You know, just training with everybody. It's a good time. Met a lot of wonderful people, and there are a lot of great people in my life that I've met because of martial arts, whether that's pre or post starting whistle kick. You know, I, I firmly believe that martial artists are overall better than non-martial artists in terms of the quality of their, their character. And uh, yeah, why would I not want to hang out with martial arts? Anyone who's participated in martial arts for any amount of time knows that those outside the martial arts don't always understand what the arts are all about. That's, that's true. A few students and I were training weapons at a park and we overheard a lady refer to our staffs as ninja sticks. And it's been an awesome inside joke ever since. What are some common or funny examples of misunderstandings from non-practitioners? I was asked if I had to put that I was a martial artist on my passport application by someone who was sure they had read you couldn't travel internationally without letting the authorities know you had been trained in the martial arts. I'll do the second one here and then respond because they're both kind of similar. Do we have to register our hands? I've been asked several times. That's from Misty. Um... Somebody was on the show in the last few months. I don't remember who it was. I wish I remembered who it was. And they pointed out that there was a magazine back in the day, 80s, 70s, maybe earlier, where you sent in a few dollars and you could register your hands as deadly weapons. And the joke of that got out of hand. Pun not intended. And people started to believe that it was true. So. People are silly and people will believe just about anything, won't they? Is this live? I can't tell. What's going on with the screen? I think we're good to go. Okay. 
because of the delay, it's really hard for me to, to tell whether or not what I'm watching is now or then, because it really doesn't change. The background doesn't change. I'm not moving around that much, and I don't have the audio on, because that would get really messed up. Other topics. And if you, uh, if you got something to ask, if you got something you want to contribute, by all means, jump in. That's the whole point of this show. I want your contribution. Is it important to use the original language of your art if your style name has American in it? Like using Japanese in American karate. Does using the original language matter at all, especially when trying to understand the interpretation of forms or movements? We've had some very conflicting opinions on this come up on the show, and I think we even had a, had this come up in the martial arts debates group, and I'm guessing that that's where Gabe pulled it. Um, I'm a firm believer that the more you do to understand, me, to understand your art, the better off you are. Whether that is traveling to the land of origin, uh, training with people from that country, um, training with a diversity of people who are well-versed in that art, understanding the language, understanding cultural customs. And here's why. How's it going to hurt? Right? If you want to understand, for the sake of tradition, what... Shit, let's pick an easy one what Shotokan karate is about. You've got a lot of books from Funakoshi. You certainly have the techniques. You have a lot of people you can train with. You can travel. You can understand what it was like to be Funakoshi as best you can. And is that going to make you better at sparring or kata? No. Is it going to help you understand the nuance of the man who founded the style? Maybe. It's not for everyone. Learning another language is not for everyone, regardless of the reason. But, let's face it, it's kind of cool to be able to travel to another country and because the person teaching karate is from Japan, they're teaching the class in Japanese, and you know enough Japanese, even though you're in India, to train in the class. I've learned a bit of Japanese and Korean through my training. I have not trained in a class where the entire class was conducted in that non-English language. But I have friends who have traveled and who have done that. I think Lessie even referenced that, that when she was in Japan and she went to the Kodokan, Everything was in Japanese. She was able to follow along. Not great. She didn't know everything they were saying, but she was able to follow along based on her knowledge of judo and her knowledge of Japanese. That's pretty cool. And it's something that I'm not saying is high on my list, but if I was presented with a good opportunity to learn Japanese and have the time, yeah, absolutely. I'd jump in or Korean, or Chinese, or, or, or. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody who's jumping in. I will say that people saying you have to learn a language are wrong. People who are saying there's no point in learning the language are wrong. Those are two extremes. Extremes are rarely true. It's usually in the middle. In fact, if you were to go back and dig up all my philosophy writing from college, the majority of it was at around the objectivity of truth and how it was always in the center of any points of ex extremity. Mm, I like this. If you could be in a martial arts movie with anyone, who would it be? What kind of role would you play? I can answer this a lot of different ways. I would love to do a movie with all of my friends. And in fact, as you might guess, yes, I have the, the rudimentary ideas for how that would go down. Uh, I've got a whole plan. Not a whole plan. I have a little bit of a plan. Uh, I would love to do a whistle kick movie and, you know, grab a, grab a bunch of people and figure something out. You know, it would probably be terrible. I would probably have some fun fight scenes, but it would be a great experience. I would love doing that. But if we look at something a little more professional, 
I would love to to try my hand at some stunt work. I would love to see what I could do in front of a camera, you know, playing a character. I have no idea how bad I would be. Would I be kind of bad or would I be really bad? Why am I assuming I wouldn't be good? Because I don't have any experience with it. And I assume if I don't have experience with something, it's probably not some hidden talent that needs to pop out that I've been suppressing all these years. But who would it be? Who would, who would be in that movie with me? Top on the list would be Jackie Chan. Because I grew up watching Jackie Chan movies and I think he's hysterical and I love his choreography and I love his charisma on screen. And I think that would be a lot of fun. I think if it was a different kind of movie, you know, because certainly Jackie Chan does specific types of movies, if it was a different kind of movie, I'd love to be in a movie with Bill Wallace. You know, I've, I've had the chance to get to know him. He's a wonderful man. I've really enjoyed my time with him. He's certainly made me a better martial artist. And I just think it would be a lot of fun to be able to say that I was in a movie with Bill Wallace. A lot of people say, you know, Superfoot's kicked me in the head. I've been to a Superfoot seminar. And there are quite a few of us who have been able to say, you know, I've earned rank under Bill Wallace. But there are very, very few people who have been able to say that they've been in a movie with him. So that would be fun. Who else? Uh, Michael Jai White. I have the utmost respect for him. He is on the short list of people who I would really, really, really love to have on this show. Keep working on it. Keep ending up in the same room with him. Keep saying he's going to do it. Just can't get it over the goal line. It'll happen. It'll happen. MJW. It's going to happen. Uh, who else? Jet Li is up there in my mind. You know, I, I think I'm struggling a little bit with the who because I look at it the same way that I look at training. I want to train with everybody. Everyone has something to teach. And I'm looking at this idea of acting not as... I mean, yeah, this is part of me as a, as a fan of movies, but more so as... It's a realm that I have not been in, so I have tons to learn. So the more people I would work with, the more I would learn. We've had a bunch of people on the show. You know, just last week, Samantha Wynn. Put me in a movie with her. I'm sure she'd teach me a ton of stuff. Who else have we had? Daniel Wu. I'd love to do a movie with him. You know, just wonderful, wonderful people. And... I have found that the vast majority of actors, actresses that we've spoken with have said yes to coming on the show and they've been great people. You know, again, there's something about being a martial artist. Now, what kind of role would I want to play? I would, I would want to play something that added a little bit of comedy to the action. You know, if I came into a fight scene, um, you know, I'd probably lose, right? Because I wouldn't be any big name on the marquee. But I would want to lose in some kind of humorous way so I could throw a little bit of, little bit of entertainment, a little bit of uh, laughter in as I'm getting my head crushed in or whatever. Oh, wow, we got things going on here. I missed them. Last time we talked about what weapons would look like if the martial arts were developed today. But what do you think the uniform would look like? Oh, I like that. Great question. If martial arts uniforms were developed today, I suspect they would be pretty similar to uh, military uniforms. Yeah, I think it'd be very much like that. T-shirt, maybe something with a collar, um, like a polo shirt, but more likely, you know, long sleeves, pants, um, elastic waistband. Um, button. And we probably wouldn't do belts. We would probably designate rank with, again, something military-like. 
you know, and it could be uh, kind of like what Tang Sudo does with the colored trim on the jackets. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we could do, and that'd be fun to see. You know, I, I, I think what I like about traditional martial arts uniforms is that they are so different to conventional clothing that you really can't tease each other, right? Like, I grew up doing martial arts and going to school and being teased for the clothes that I had because we didn't have money to spend on clothes. I mean, you know, I had enough, but it's not like I was rocking the latest outfits and brand names. And even the quote-unquote least cool brand of martial art uniform still looks pretty darn close to the nicest one. You know, it might not move as well, the material might not be as good, it might not last as long, but, you know, it's, a, it's an equal playing field. I like that. What do you call having your grandma on speed dial? Instagram. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, Stacy has a, a incorrect but honorable mention vote for gramophone. What's the coolest, craziest, or weirdest award you've seen at a tournament? I'm not answering that one. Why? Because I either have to lie or throw people under buses. I have seen ridiculous things at tournaments. And I'm not even going to... Here's the problem. I've seen some of those ridiculous things happen recently enough, over the last few years, certainly within whistle kick time, that I don't know that I can even hint at things without a, people speculating and... I'm just not going to do that. I don't like to talk ill of people. I have my ideas of what's right, what's proper, what's appropriate, but not everyone shares those. And that's okay. It doesn't have to be what I say. We've all got different ideas, and that's great. There was a snoring cat right there. Most of the general population has a great fear of public speaking. Yes. Well, in fact, I, I'm... I mean, isn't that often quoted as the greatest fear? Do martial artists share the same fear when it comes to teaching their class or giving instruction? Yes. Now, yeah. it certainly becomes easier to speak to a group that you know. So generally, by the time that you were asked to um, run part of class or take over for a class or whatever, you know the people that you're teaching, at least for the most part. So that's not nearly as scary, but I've known plenty of people, myself included, who the first few dozens of times they were put in front of a room to teach martial arts did not do well. Now you get better. You get a lot better. And it's from that experience that I was able to step into martial arts radio and do a lot of these things that I do filling time. If you look at the way someone talks, someone who seems really confident in front of a camera, in front of a microphone, they are doing certain things to fill that time as their mind is catching up to what they're saying. You notice that I'm shifting the cadence of my words. Sometimes I'm talking a little bit slower because I'm not quite sure what I'm going to say. There are times in martial arts radio that I start asking a question of a guest or responding to a question that they ask me and I don't know what I'm going to say. So I start very generally and my mind's rolling and I eventually pick up on something. But then there are other times where I know exactly what I want to say and so the cadence of my words is a little bit faster and you can tell that I'm more confident what I'm saying because there's less space in between my words. What do a lot of people do when they're trying to fill that time? They'll pause. They'll use filler words like um, hmm, uh, like, but, uh, hmm, make noises. You go back to early days of martial arts radio. I did a lot of that. I've gotten better. I learned it was better to just slow down, 
or to pause. Lately, so has crept back in. I've been working to push that one back out. It's scary talking to people. It's scary being in front of a room. It can be exhilarating. I've done it enough now that I don't know that I care. And a lot of that goes back to martial arts. Not just teaching, but competing. Competing on you know, some decently large stages in front of bunches of people. In front of my high school. You get enough anxiety, enough times, you just learn to roll with it doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means you can work through it. According to a few sources, the old boxer Joe Lewis, not Joe Lewis, kickboxer, martial artist, was the one who started the joke of registering your hands as deadly weapons. I did not know that. I would, I would love for, um, for a source on that game, if you can find a source on that. Not because I disbelieve you, but because it would be nice to finally, officially credit that. What drill, game, or exercise should every martial arts school in the world have? Slow sparring. Slow sparring. When I teach, when I travel, when I do seminars, which, by the way, if your school wants me for a seminar, I'm cheap. Pretty much at this point, as we're rolling that part out, if you can cover expenses, I'll be there. There's a magic in slowing things down. It doesn't matter whether it's forums, doesn't, doesn't matter whether it's basics, but the place where I've had the most success helping people is in combat situations, sparring, self-defense, whatever, and bringing it down to a speed where people can start to look at what's actually going on and their brain has the opportunity to move faster than their hands so they can really consider how they're moving. Going back to the beginning, not the beginning, but earlier in the episode, we talked about how people have these grand ideas of what's going to happen if they get into a self-defense situation. And it actually happens and they're nowhere near what, where they want it to be. Why? Because stress, etc., forces you to your lowest level of training. Cat, get off the table. Sorry. If you take your sparring and you're constantly sparring here at a high level, you're going to do the movements you're most comfortable with and you're going to spar in a way that makes you feel most protected. But if you slow it down so the fear, the risk, is reduced, you can start to open up and you can start to try new things. You can take that wide range of techniques that you've been training for however long and start to incorporate those and um, better your own personal sparring style. If I had to pick a second one, I grew up calling, because I grew up in a karate school, I grew up calling it Sensei Says. You know, it's essentially Simon Says. But what I like about that game is it's super easy. And you can have people do anything. And here's a hint. Instructors, if you really need to get through some basics and young students are being problematic, hey, we're going to play Simon Says. And you just, you know, one out of every six or seven times, that you tell them to do something, you just gotta twist it a little bit, not say Simon says, they will pay much better attention. Really easy. But what I like about that drill is that typically in martial arts classes, especially when you're talking basics and really fundamental movement, people tune out and they just kind of collectively observe what everyone else is doing. You know, you're, you're stepping down the floor, throwing punches, bam, 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 bam. And no one person's really leading it. It's just kind of this group thought. But you introduce a drill like that, now everyone has to pay attention. Especially if there's penalties. If there's, you know, penalty push-ups or whatever, 
now there's a consequence, and now they're going to be much more observational with what's happening. The joys of live entertainment. They say not to work with children or animals. Hello, Jeremy's cat. <laughs> Yeah, so Gabe has um, a link here to something saying that police were often on hand during press conferences to register boxers as deadly weapons. It was a publicity stunt carrying no legal weight. Interesting. Good to know. What are some good martial art related fundraisers for schools other than kickathons? I think this is often overthought. Why does it have to be martial arts movement? Why does it have to be kicks? Why does it have to be... Why? Why does it have to be that? Um, I think that while there's some value there, and I think that there's some good publicity, some good you know, press release stuff, and it, it's great for kids, I think you can do more. What's to stop someone from saying, you know what? I'm going to go compete at this tournament. I'm going to pay my way in. But I want to do it for this cause. I'm going to raise money for such and such. And I'm going to live stream it. Now, this is off the cuff. I didn't read any of these ahead of time. So is that a great response? No. But the idea of fundraising having to be competitive, um, you know, I was asked to sell candy bars back in school and didn't. There are a lot of ways that you can support organizations that don't involve kickathons. What about showing the community that martial artists are about more than just training? What about just going around? And instead of raising the money to give the money, what about donating the time? What about, hey, um, you know, find out from local organizations, nonprofits, who's in need? What do they need? Who needs their lawn mowed? Who needs wood stacked? Who needs leaves raked? And just go help them. Maybe you wear a school shirt while you do it. I think we, we look for these dramatic fundraisers because we're focused on the wrong thing. We're focused on the publicity part of it. Now, I'm not saying that it shouldn't, shouldn't be there. But I'm suggesting that if you focus on how do you help, not how do you help in a fancy way, the other stuff falls in line. The other stuff people see. Breakathons. Did you hear about the Keebler elf who got into a fight? Man, he is one tough cookie. <laughs> Has the publication and sale of the book, the Martial Artist Handbook, gone as you expected? I don't think I really had expectations, to be honest. Um... I had a feeling it would be well received and that was because I shared it with a number of people for editing and it was well received. It is too early to tell whether or not this is going to be something that sells a few copies a month or much more. You know, it's very general in nature and it's been very educational and in typical Jeremy fashion, I've got like seven other book ideas and it becomes a question of prioritizing them. Because the idea of writing a book and hanging it out there and it's selling and just putting some money back in the Whistlekick checking account, it's pretty exciting. So if anybody has ideas for what the next book should be, I've got tons of ideas.
But if you have a suggestion, I'd love to hear it. And you can always email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. One thing I neglected to mention, uh, we've got the Patreon. If you want to support the work that we're doing here for as little as $2 a month, if you contribute $5 or more a month, you get extra content. Uh, in fact, today I put up a blog post outlining, uh, this was for anybody who was on Patreon, um, all of the episodes that we have in the can ready to go, all the episodes we have scheduled to record. It's the first time I've ever released that information publicly. So that felt kind of fun. Um, there's some talk about doing a little bit of filming for the upcoming or for the, the still kind of rolling J Money, Life and Times of Grandmaster J Money, uh, fiction video series. I don't even know what to call it. Fake reality show. Uh, that's been fun, but that's been really challenging. It's been hard work because I wanted to do it differently than the other things that we've done. And it's meant to be humorous and I'm hyper aware of what Master Ken's doing and so I'm trying to do things very differently. Shout out to Matt, Matt Page. Stacy says she's on her second copy of the book, Santa Stole Her First One. Well, um, I wasn't aware Santa stole things, but thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for everyone's support. Uh, for the book, for watching, for listening, for all of it. You know, it really means the world to me. And I'm just happy I get to do what I do. You know, I, I said it before, I'll say it again. If it wasn't for people paying attention, I would just be a crazy guy talking. And the difference between a crazy guy talking and a internet personality or whatever I am is people value it. And... If you're watching it, you value it in some way, so thank you. And I value you for doing so. If you want to check out everything that we've got going on, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com and, of course, whistlekick.com for the full complement of all the stuff that we're doing. And if you want to make a purchase in the store, you can save 15% with the code PODCAST15. That's one of the ways you can help us out uh, and get some stuff for it. We've got an entirely new apparel plan for 2020 which I think I have time on Thursday carved out that I'm going to start working on that. Um, and there will be a blog post and the newsletter and everything announcing what we're doing differently. So that I'm looking forward to that. If you want to follow us on social media, we're at Whistlekick everywhere you can think of. I already told you my email address. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. So, yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. I appreciate everything. And, uh, Casey says, you're still a crazy guy talking, but now you have an audience. And I can't think of a better way to close out the show. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.